my name is Marcia. I'm known around here as Alex's wife. So I have the privilege to read um, the scripture this morning. It comes from John 16, 25 through 33. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, oh, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Thank you. So we're going to focus on that last verse that she read. And um, I'll repeat it. It says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, or we'll use the word trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, in this world you will have trouble. That is a very easy uh, idea for everyone to buy into, right? Everyone has trouble. Like we all have trouble in our lives. Now, what that trouble is, that could be, you know, relative, isn't it? You know, like we were already talking about traffic today. Traffic is trouble. Everyone hates traffic. That's an easy thing for us to connect to. We'll talk more about it. But in the grand scheme of life, if traffic is your problem, you're like, you know what, that's not a bad life, right? Because trouble is something that is relative really to your perception and to your experience. So trouble could be a bad day, it could be waking up late, trouble could be anything as simple as just someone, a word someone says, uh, clothes that didn't fit right, an expectation that didn't work out. But trouble could also be something that's very terrible. It could be a huge trauma, it could be a big pain. Trouble could be a hopeless situation that you don't know the way out and you don't know how to go forward. So the idea that you will have trouble in this world is easy for us to all to connect to, even though that trouble could be a wide variety of things. Now, dealing with trouble is something that we have many tools to access and there's many ways that we do that, right? Now, what trouble means to you could be learned in a very simple formula of A, B, C, okay? A is that there's an adverse thing that happens. There's something happens that you didn't want to happen. So that's A. There's adversity in this world. Something didn't go the way you planned or the way you expected or something was done horribly to you or a circumstance happened. So A, there's an adverse situation. B, there's what you believe about that situation. What you believe about the thing that happens really dictates what C is. C is the consequence. It's how you react to it. Okay, so A, something adverse could happen. Let's use traffic. Since we all hate traffic, but it's really like a non-moral thing that's not going to get any, you know, anything triggered there. We'll say, oh, look, somebody cut me off. All right? Somebody pulled out, happened to me. I was right here at university. Somebody pulled out in front of me really slow. I'm like, why did they have to pull out in front of me slow? All right? Don't pull out if you're not going to go. So pull out in front of me slow, and then I could kind of see, oh, okay. Like, you know, I saw some hair. So I was like, oh, she's like, you know, she's, it's, 
it's harder sometimes to drive. I feel really bad driving in Miami. I know I am an aggressive driver. I know this world is an aggressive driver. And so when I see some people uh, that are older driving, I feel bad because I realize it's got to be hard to drive in this environment. So I immediately was like, you know what? A, why did you do that? That was the adversity. Then B, I believed, oh, this, this person uh, is, is older. This is a difficult thing to do. Let me calm down and back off their bumper a little bit because, you know, there's no need for me to ride on them. Then I saw them take a three-lane turn through the right, and I realized, oh, this is a young kid who just was on his phone in front of me, and now he's ready to go. And then I was angry again because what I believed about the situation changed. Now I was like, this punk's on his phone cutting me off, and now he's ready to go. So the, the reaction that I had to what was trouble changed dramatically about what I thought about it. All right? And so we can see that happen in many areas of our life. A, something happens, B, you have a perception of it, and then C, you have a reaction. And now, there's a great book called Learned Optimism where it teaches you skills on how to deal with that. It'll say A, B, C, and then D, you dispute your belief of what happened. So now you begin to enter ideas, like, like when I was saying, oh, well, maybe this person is... Uh, you know, distracted because something's going on in their life. Or maybe this person has difficulty driving because they can't see very well. Or maybe this person, and you begin to now put in more uh, empathetic ideas so that you're able to calm yourself down because now you relate and you care. And then that E energizes you to react differently. So this is a, a common tool that you could use to bring more peace in your life when you have an experience of adversity. And then B, you think about what do I believe about it? C, you see how you react. D, you dispute your impression to see if that's really the way they did it. And then E, you're energized. You can see this happen in an example. Let's say someone doesn't take out the trash, All right? Maybe it's your kid's job. Maybe it's your husband's job. Maybe it's your job. If it's your job, you got nothing to say about it, right? But somebody didn't do something you expected them to do. So when you see that trash pile there, you're like, oh, you're angry. How could they neglect this? But don't they care? Don't they do the job? So you A, saw something. B, your initial thought was that someone had a motive that was negative into this so that they didn't care, they didn't look, they didn't whatever. And then C, you reacted. But if... You D, dispute your claim, your cause of what happened. Then you look through and you say, you know what? Maybe they had a good cause. Maybe they're distracted in some way. Maybe they're doing something important. Let me go ask and see what's going on. And I bet at that point, E, they'll be energized. Say, oh, let's do that. Let's solve it. Now, this learned optimism is a nice way to control some areas of peace in your life. But I don't think it's really the ultimate answer. It's not going to solve a lot of things. Now, when you think peacefulness, and when you hear peacefulness, I think there's another letter that might come to mind, and that's the letter Z, where people talk about Zen. Zen's almost like a, like a synonym for this, right? Uh, especially now, like in our society that believes more in like spirituality and an openness of spirituality or yoga or Zen. And so Zen is... A, an idea that, that comes, it's a Chinese word and it comes out of a Buddhist philosophy. And in the, the mindset of Zen, what do you do is you take meditation, okay? And maybe you always see that as someone sitting in a calm, I hope I get back up. And you calm your breathing and you start to try to not think about anything. Now, in, in this mindset of philosophy, your idea is to connect to the universe around you. I, I don't believe in that theologically, so please don't say, well, this guy's teaching Buddhism. Um, but then the second aspect of it is the idea that your suffering comes from your passions. So the, the reason you feel your anxiety or your pain is because you care too much about something. And that if you detach from caring from that, then your pain will go away. And so in this mindfulness, this mindset, this spirituality is that you detach from the passions of this world and the desires that you have, and then you'll be at peace because you will no longer have the suffering or the anxious of not getting what you want. Now, we saw this happen, well, we didn't see it, but we read about it happening in the history of the church in the Middle Ages where uh, monasteries came out because 
uh, even in the Christian church, it was like, you know what? You got to separate from the world and from all the desires. You, you shouldn't have a family. You shouldn't have friends. You shouldn't have money. You should just go and be inside a castle and commune with God so that you're separated from all the things of the world. And now you no longer suffer because you're in this, com- this commune. You're in this isolation. And so the idea of Zen might bring you peace, but it does so with the idea of detaching you from the, the emotions and the things that God's given us in this world. And so that, oh, now that I don't care, now I won't suffer. And so you try to teach yourself to not care. But I don't think that's a really a good solution for finding peace. Because now you're detached away from the things that you enjoy and love. Now, another way that we search for peace is through... Avoidance. Uh, avoidance comes in different forms. Uh, usually it comes like in addictions or uh, things like that. So if I'm struggling with things in this world, I have trouble, but you know what? Uh, drinking every night helps to numb it. So I avoid the trouble, but I don't feel as bad at, at bedtime. Same with um, maybe finding other methods of addiction to avoid it. It could be physical exertion. It, it could be, um, you know, just always a passion to travel, to go, to do. It's just constantly move forward. For, don't think about what's the problem. Just aggressively move forward in another way so that you don't have to worry about this trouble. Or find a sedative like alcohol or smoke something and just relax a little bit and take the edge off and realize you never actually dealt with the trouble. This also com- compiles over time and then the trouble bites you. And now you have two. You have the after effects of the addiction and the running and then you have whatever the trouble that started it. So we search for peace in so many different ways and these are all ways that we try to physically create our own peace. And you know, many of them are good skills. It's good to learn some of these skills. It's good to learn uh, meditation and quietness and not to be so attached to things of this world. It's good to learn optimism and to learn to have empathetic ways to view. All these things are helpful, but they don't give us ultimate peace. In this last line, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. In me, you have peace. Peace is found in Jesus Christ. And he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. This is a phrase that I hope that you remember the rest of this week and all that goes through your life is take heart, I have overcome the world. Because I want us to see how Jesus has overcome the world. Now, how many of you ever heard the phrase, the crux of the matter? Is anybody, is that... Is that a phrase that is kind of, I mean, it's something I knew, so I was like, well, I hope everybody hears this phrase, right? The crux of the matter is, right? The crux of the matter is this. And when you say the crux of the matter, you're saying, like, the the central most important part of this is this. So you might have this complex problem, but you'll say, look, the crux of the matter is, and then you kind of narrow it to this is the thing that is the thing. Don't get distracted by all the other things. And so what this phrase comes out is this word crux. Crux is the Latin word for cross, And so sometimes in our society, we don't realize how Christianity and what Christ has done actually influences even our language and our time and our all kinds of structures. But this phrase comes from the idea that central to everything is the cross. That Jesus dying on the cross was centered to human history and it was central to our life in finding eternal life and joy in Christ. So the crux of the matter, the cross, the thing that's central and most important is that so God had came and he died for us now it's very strange that the thing that gives us peace was actually violence the cross was a very violent dark thing we see the cross as a religious symbol but the cross was a murder it was an atrocity I don't know if you guys remember, way back like in the year 2000, Mel Gibson produced the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Did everybody watch that back then? I remember I watched it and it was so heavy to watch, wasn't it? 
It was so painful to watch as it tried to realistically depict the suffering of Christ on the cross, the disfigurement of him, and just the pain. And I remember just like, oh, like we would watch it like on Good Friday and just be so heavy. Because the cross was a very dark moment. It was an act of violence that led somehow to peace. Because in this world, there is a darkness that you can't ignore. There was a darkness that had to be dealt with. And you know, I don't like to enter into those dark times. I don't like to talk about them or see them, but they're there. And God wasn't afraid to enter into the darkness of the evil of this world. I remember the first time that we had delivered something through the care portal. There was a young lady, early 20s. She already had a three-year-old. She just had a baby. She had aged out of foster care. And I remember driving up to the apartment that was given to her through the system and being just nervous for myself and saying, I would never let my wife or kids come here. And I remember the fear I had and then bringing a changing table to this young girl and realizing this is her home now. And the complexity of her being abandoned as a child and then being a young single mom and then having only the accessibility of using things given to her through the different systems that we have as being her way of life. I was just like, how? There's no solution here. My changing table doesn't change her situation. It's an act of kindness, it's a glimmer of love, it's a, it's a thing we can do, but I realize this is a darkness I don't even wanna to try to get into to understand it. Just the other day, I ran into a lady and she was living on the street and she's sharing her story. She loved to talk about her past and you could tell that there was a mental health issue there and she was sharing about how she was uh, abandoned by her family. And then when her adoptive parents died, so they took away her child. And then she was stuck in this story of I'm looking for my son, I'm looking for my son. And you knew there was no solution for her, no home, no resource, no ability to find and, and whatever the real story, I'll never know. But when you entered in that darkness, he's like, where is that solution? There's a movie that just came out and had people saying, oh, you've got to go see this, The Sound of Freedom, right? It's, it's a movie that talks about uh, how this group is going in and trying to uh, disrupt the sex trade that goes on and save little boys and girls. And, and it was, and I, so I listened to a podcast of it. I started listening to the podcast and it just got too heavy for me. I couldn't hear any more about it. You know, I said, I can't go watch the movie. I know I would love to support the people who are doing a great cause. I said, but I couldn't go to the theater. It's like, I can't go sit in a theater and watch it and then go get ice cream and hang out and move on with life. When I watch it, I want it to impact me and me do something. Because there's so much darkness in this world, isn't there? And God entered into this darkness and the cross is the crux of the matter. It's God saying, I am going to come and battle evil. I'm going to fight it and beat it. Jesus says, I have overcome the world because he knew that on the cross, he could bring righteousness and justification and salvation to an evil people who were hurting each other in terrible ways. He says, I can redeem them. I can save them. And so through this act of violence, peace is able to come through us. And last week, Worth was talking about this. He was talking about the Friday, the darkness, how that even in the darkness that you could have joy because of this. And then the statement that he, he referenced is, but Sunday is a coming. 
Because there is where he overcame the world through the cross, where he would battle evil. He didn't say, I can't handle it. He didn't say it's too much. He didn't say, I'll depart from it. I'll detach. He says, I'm going straight to the middle of it. I will destroy evil on the cross. I will take it away. But that wasn't the end. And so you have Jesus saying things to the disciples here. We're in verse 16. He says, a little while and I'll be leaving you. And then a little while and I'll come back to you. Now they didn't get that right away. It reminded me of Thursday, Granada Day School started its first day of preschool here. And I saw some of you parents were here. And we got to see that experience of a little while, I'm going to leave you, and then a little while, I'm going to come back. Now, when kids come to preschool and they come fairly, some of them love it. Some of them are like, new toys, new friends, and they just run in the room and they're ready to do their, their preschool chaos, just screaming and laughing in joy. Other kids grab on to mom or dad and you cannot push them into the room. They're crying, mom, no. And the parents are like, look, in a little while, I'm going to leave you, but in a little while, I'm coming back. And they don't believe you're ever going to come back. They're just like, no, you can't dump me here. These kids are crazy. They're going to... And so you see, they're not able to buy in and understand. This passage of scripture in John chapters 13 through 17 is that moment. This is that moment. So in John chapter 13, you see Jesus doing a foot washing at the Last Supper. So he does the foot washing and then he does the communion presentation that we still celebrate where he passes the cup. And then he says this thing, he says, somebody here is going to betray me. And everyone's like, what? No way, that couldn't happen. Except for Judas, where Judas is like, hey guys, I'm going to go get more wine and pita. And he slips out. And then Jesus says, now, let's talk. And he gathers them. And this whole series all summer coming through the next three weeks is this conversation that Jesus is having with them. He says, look, a little while I'm going to leave you. And you're going to be scattered and scared and alone and troubled. But take heart. I've overcome the world. I'm coming back. And so John 14 verse 1. John 14, 1 kicked off the series where it, it says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms. And I hope that you've memorized this. It says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. You see him talking about the trouble that is here. He's saying, look, don't live in this trouble now. Look to what we are building. Look to where I am taking you. Look to what I am redeeming. So when he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. On the cross, he, de de he destroys evil. But at the resurrection, he destroys death. And so through these two destructions that God has done, he is able to give us the peace we leave, live in. So now we have his peace because we can look to eternal life. And this is seeing life at the end. This is understanding what is the end game of all of this. If the end game of all of this was to, to live this life and when it's over, it's dirt and you just recycle, then this trouble is too much. It seems pointless, it's empty, it's vain. But if this life has purpose that's eternal, if Jesus told the truth when he says, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to receive you, that where I am, there you will be also, then this trouble is momentary, as momentary and trivial as Paul called it, because there's something greater. I love how Beatrice said, my husband, I didn't lose my husband, I know exactly where he is. She knows that he is in heaven with the Father and she will be reunited. It was a couple weeks ago, I had the, the honor and privilege to be able to attend the memorial service for Dr. Rick Blackwood. He was the pastor who led Christ Fellowship, which is an amazing church in our city that's done stuff for decades. And he had passed away in a battle for cancer a few weeks ago, and so there was a celebration of life for him. To be able to sit in their large sanctuary and, and worship, enjoy, knowing 
that his life hadn't ended, but that he had actually achieved what he preached and spoke for decades. In fact, on the back cover of the, uh, of the bulletin that they handed out was a quote that he had preached at a time before. And it said this, someday you will read in the papers that Rick Blackwood of Miami is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. Eternal life. Understanding that what God has promised to us of life eternal in heaven with him forever brings justice to all these things that we can't quite figure out and justify. It brings hope to all these situations that we can't hope and figure out and find the answer to. It brings peace when we adjust all our mindset of the things of this world and we say, look, I know my father has prepared a place for me. So Jesus is communicating this multiple times. That's why you'll see in these sermons themes just keep reoccurring. Jesus used repetition in this section. Jesus says the word truly, truly, 26 times in the book of John. Truly, truly, right? That's what you say when you're trying to really say, this is true. You repeat, right? When you're excited and you want to say, no, really, really, look, look. You repeat the word. You say it over so that you're able to say, no, 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 I want you to get it. So you'll say, truly, truly, to lay this bedrock of a foundation that we could depend on what he's saying. Another word that he repeated over is the word father. He says father 36 times in this chapter. And over 114 times in the book of John. Telling you, this is your father. This is your father. This is your father. He's bringing that relational connection. Now the next three sermons are a prayer where Jesus talks about father. So I'm not going to go in anymore on that. But realize he's saying your father cares. The third thing that's repeated, something Charlie Morgan pointed out to me last week. Or last month. He says, if you pray in my name. Six times in these chapters, in this one conversation that he has with his disciples after they dismiss Judas and before Judas returns, he says, if you ask in my name, if you ask in my name, if you ask in my name. Six times he says that in that passage. So what does if you ask in my name mean? Now, sometimes we, had let, we have adopted this into just at the end of whatever you pray, say in Jesus' name, Amen. And so we all end our prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay? So not a bad thing, but just realize that's not a stamp that says Jesus now has to do it because you said in Jesus' name. It's like, oh, use my name. All right, let's do this. Right? It's not us <laughs> adopting and taking Jesus' name and saying, here, let me give you my plans and this is what you have to do. But rather, when you say, when you pray in Jesus' name, when you ask in his name, it's when you're asking for his will, and you're working on his behalf. To illustrate that, how many of you, see, everyone here had brothers or sisters. Everyone have brothers and sisters? Only children, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just dismiss you on this, but brothers and sisters, all right? So, <clears throat> I had brothers, so I'll reference brothers. If you have sisters, just input sisters. I'm sure they're the same. So, <clears throat> let's say, in the house, in the kitchen, you get like all these delicious cookies, right? Mom bakes cookies or whatever. You buy cookies, you bring them in. And what happens? The big brother immediately takes over. They're his. And here you are, I want a cookie. They're like, no, give me one. No. Mom made them. No. And so you're like, you argue. And then what do you do? Mom. And then you run to the other room. Mom, he won't give me a cookie. Right? Mom says, go tell them I said you get one. Now what happens when you go back in? You go back in with this power that you didn't have as a little bratty little brother. You now have mom's power. And you go, mom said. And when you say mom said, your brother has to obey you. Right? So here, he reluctantly crushes the smallest cookie and hands it to you with the worst face. Right? It's the okay. Because mom said. You asked in mom's name, and now you have mom's power and authority to do this thing. So when Jesus says, if you ask in my name, he's talking about how you are coming 
with what Jesus had wanted to accomplish. You're coming with the authority of what Jesus was doing. And you say, this God, this is what I want to do. I want to do the plan you work it out. I want to do the will that you've been pouring out. And you ask in his name, Jesus, this is what you wanted. You see that. And each of the times it says, ask in my name. In chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, he says, if you ask in my name, you'll do greater works than I have done. That's crazy, right? Because this is Jesus saying that. But think about this. When Jesus was on earth, his church could have fit in here. It was a few hundred followers. If he wasn't giving free food out on the hills, he just had a few hundred people. When they gathered in a room, it was a few hundred people. They could fit in this church when Jesus was the pastor. But when he left, now there's over 2.2 billion Christians in the world. I know it's a statistic, people checking a box. It might not all be real, but that's bigger. You see how God's message and God's power has gone through the entire globe and reached generations and generations. It's we have done greater works. Not in our power, because we asked in his name. That was Jesus' stamp saying, what I came to do is now spreading everywhere and his kingdom is growing beyond the point it was when he was there. Chapter 15, 16 says, if you ask in my name, you will abide in me and you will bear fruit. So when we ask in Jesus' name, we become disciples who walk close to him. That's why we push so heavily, walk with me. Because to follow Christ isn't to listen and gain knowledge. It is to incorporate into our life the things that Jesus has taught. And we do that with each other because we need to support and help and check and balance together. And you'll see fruit that way. Chapter 16, verse 23 and 24, worth preached on last week. When you ask in my name, you'll have joy that no one can take away. Joy that's unspeakable. Joy that perseveres. And then in this passage, if you ask in my name, it says you have the love of the Father who grants it. The love of the Father. And there he brings right back around to the Father. And so peace comes from abiding in Jesus. But peace doesn't mean you're not going to have any trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But peace is knowing that God gives you eternal life and grace to persevere. So Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. That you stepped into this world to defeat evil. and You did it at your own cost. Your own sacrifice so that we might have your righteousness. So God, forgive us our sin, the sins that we do, the evil that's within us, but then also, Lord, forgive us for not standing in the way of evil in others. We know that you are just and you are gracious, and we invite you into, this, into our lives to change and transform us. And Lord, we want to live in the joy and the peace of knowing that you make all things good in your time. In Jesus' name, amen.